Good evening, Grace Point. Whether you are here in the sanctuary or you are joining us online, I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you are a visitor and joining our tonight's service, we are glad and thankful to have you. And so we now come to the presence of the Lord in prayer. Come, let us pray. Loving and gracious God, who was crushed because of our sins, was pierced because of our guilt, the punishment to bring us into peace was upon you, Lord. With your wounds, we are saved and we are healed. And so, Lord, as we gather tonight to hear, to listen to you speaking to us, we pray that you will awaken our presence into your presence, O oh Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be invoked at this moment in time as we come as we are and just lay our lives at your feet. And so, Lord, we pray that you'll speak clearly because sometimes there's so many voices in the world and they cloud your voice. As we participate in worship this evening, inspire us through the power of your Holy Spirit. And as we continue to worship, let us encounter you, Lord. Be with us in this time of worship. And as we pray in the matchless name of our Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. And so I invite you to stand as we join into worship. Carried the cross, love so amazing, love so amazing. Let's sing that again. He became sin. He became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. Humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah. Yes. 
Would rocks cry out to worship? Whose glory taught the stars to shine? Perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing, but this joy is mine. With a thousand hallelujahs. We magnify your name. You alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. Who else would die for our Resurrection means our eyes. There isn't time enough to sing of all you've done, but I have eternity to try. With a thousand hallelujahs, we magnify. Jesus, the 
Give life, you are love. You bring light to darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you. Give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that's broken. Bring light to the darkness you give 
so grateful, Lord, for the gift of each life that, that is here, Lord. Every life connecting online, every life that is here in the sanctuary. We just say thank you, God, for your goodness and your grace, your mercy. We just thank you for your incredible love, Lord. May you continue to work in our hearts tonight, Lord as we lean in to hear what you have to say to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please, will you have a seat? So thank you for the worshiping team for leading us in worship. Uh, just a few notices. Uh, we remind us, we remind ourselves again that tomorrow we continue with our Holy Week services. Tomorrow we'll have our guest preacher, Reverend Mzwan Lemolo, from the South African Council of Churches, followed by Thursday service, which will be our service of shadows. Our Tenebrae service, a very important service in the life of a Christian. And then on Friday, do not forget that on Friday, we'll have two services. We'll have the 8.15, our one hour, one, one hour Good Friday service. 
Then at 10 o'clock, we'll have a two-hour services when we will listen to Jesus speaking with the different seven words or seven sayings. And then on Sunday, we start celebrating our Easter service, our resurrection by our sunrise service at six o'clock in the garden. And it will be followed by our normal 8, 15, and 10 o'clock services. Uh, just also one reminder is that in the chap here in the sanctuary, we have the stations of Jesus. And we invite everyone at any time our property is open from 6, to 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Anytime you can just come and reflect during this time of passion of Christ. We are also excited about our post-Easter teachings and preaching that will start on the 7th of April. It is called It's Complicated, where we'll be exploring the complicated, complicated relational life of the Old Testament character, David. And so we invite you to come as we explore our life as a resurrected church post-resurrection. And now I invite our guest preacher, Reverend Damien Ogradi, who will be leading us tonight Reverend Damien is a minister at the Westview Methodist Church and he will be sharing and reflecting with us tonight as we listen through him, Jesus speaking to the priest. And so we welcome Reverend Damien. Can we just pray for you? Sure. Lord, we pray upon your blessing upon your servant, that the word that you have laid upon his heart, he can proclaim it by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, for your fresh anointing as he takes us through in one of the conversations that Jesus made. And so may the words of his mouth and the meditations and reflections and contemplations of all our hearts Please pleasing to your sight, O oh God, our rock. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And we give a warm welcome to Reverend Damien. Thanks, Linda. Good, uh, good evening, Grace Point. Uh, it's good to be here. Good to see everyone. But also we get our scripture reading from Luke chapter 22. And we read very shortly from verses 66 to verse 71. Luke chapter 22, verses 66 to verse 71. The text reads as follows. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law met together, and Jesus was led before them. If you are the Messiah, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, are you then the Son of God? He replied, you say that I am. Then they said, why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we trust and we pray that God will bless it to us this evening. Friends, as I start the sermon, I think that I can proclaim and share without any doubt, dismay, disagreement, that there are generally things that distract us as human beings. By nature, there are some things that call and clamor for our attention, that challenges us to put our agenda aside in order to give attention to whatever is calling our name. I don't know about you, but I love to eat well. And so when I am home for Easter or when I'm home on holiday, and I smell a good cooked meal in the kitchen that my grandmother is preparing for me, it causes me 
to move from the room that I'm in in my house to the kitchen to go see what's up. For those of us who might not resonate with a good meal, maybe for those of us who are penny pinchers and we like to budget and save as much money as we can, that sign that says two for the price of one is genuinely and generally something that captures our attention because we know that we are able to negotiate and bargain for a deal that we would otherwise not be able to get. For those of us who are major sports fans, when you are unable and you are frustrated by the fact that you are unable to watch your sports team play their live match, you get home and you see the scores flash across your TV, immediately your heart begins to beat outside of your chest because you remember that it's calling for your attention in the hope that your team has won the game. And yet, I think that if there's one thing that really clamors and calls for our attention, I think all of us can agree that something called a mirror generally calls for us to divert our attention from what we were focused on. I think very few of us can make the proclamation or the confession that we've never turned and looked at a mirror when we've walked past the mirror. All of us have at some moment crossed paths with a mirror and genuinely stopped in our tracks to have a look at what we really look like. Friends, a mirror generally calls us to ask one simple question. Does my external reality match my internal conviction? Do I really look like what I think I look like? Friends, I don't know about you, but sometimes mirrors are good for trying to check if you have something stuck in your teeth. For those of us who have gone through the heat and the humidity of Gauteng's heat wave, we look in the mirror to see what the heat has done to our hair. For those of us who look in our mirror regularly, sometimes it's to see if that dress fits appropriately, to see if that tie that we're wearing is crooked and is in need of straightening out. Friends, a mirror will always clamor and call for our attention because on a deeper level, a mirror asks us the following question. Does our daily practice line up with our philosophy and our principle of life? Does what we do daily live in accordance with what we really believe about God and about ourselves? Friends, can I remind you and reintroduce you to Luke chapter 22? That this is this mirror moment for the chief priests and the teachers of the law. That as they think that they have Jesus on trial, Jesus somehow, some way, turns the trial back on them and holds up a mirror to their convictions and to their character. This is not the Jesus that we are introduced to in Sunday school. No, no, no. This is not the sanctified Jesus who we find on stained glass windows, who holds open his hands to welcome all people. No, no, this is the Jesus who is genuinely and generally a threat to the religious establishment of his day. After all, that's why Jesus gets executed and crucified. He's not only a threat to Rome and the social order of the day, but he's also a genuine threat to the religious order and establishment that surrounds him. So friends, I want to encourage you when you get home, go read the account of Jesus in his final week of his life again. Just to give you a reminder and a refresher, on Sunday, we celebrated Palm Sunday because we remembered it was the day in which Jesus came on the back of a donkey into Jerusalem. We remember Monday yesterday was the day when Jesus entered the temple and cleansed it. By the time you get to Thursday, Jesus has been arrested and he has been put on trial in front of the Sanhedrin and the chief priests. Now, unfortunately, our reading this evening in Luke only gives us a very snippet and a summarized version of what goes down in his trial. I want to encourage you when you get home, go read Matthew's account and John's account and you would, re you would recall and realize that there are all kinds of illegalities and hypocrisies when Jesus is put on trial. Can I give you some examples? In John and in Matthew, the sun had already set, and they begin to proceed with the trial of Jesus on the basis of blasphemy. Now, if you know Jewish law, you would remember that a trial is not allowed to begin on the basis of the Sabbath beginning on the Saturday when the sun goes down. Secondly, the chief priests and the religious leaders pay people to witness under false pretense and commit perjury in order to make the facade as if Jesus really did commit blasphemy. Friends, everything is wrong with this trial. And yet... Jesus reminds the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, 
that you may think that you have outwitted me, but by three simple sentences, allow me to remind you that I'm turning a mirror back onto your accusations to call your character and your conviction into question. Now, I have to give you some background in order that you can understand the breakdown. Let me give you the, the context so that you can understand the content. The question we should be asking here is, who are the chief priests and the teachers of the law? I have to give you a brief uh, history lesson here, and there will be a quiz at the end of the sermon. So please pay close attention. The chief priests and the teachers of the religious law are comprised majorly, and the majority of the compromise of the chief priest and the teachers of the law were those groups and sects known as the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You should know by reading the Gospels that these are the people that Jesus consistently and constantly bumps his head against. Now what's interesting is that the Pharisees and the Sadducees taught and ultimately propagated that a valid relationship with God is only found on the basis of the Mosaic law, the Pentateuch or the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And so they taught that they were the only people who could correctly interpret and teach the law to the people of Israel. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees differed on one ground. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees did not, and so they had no scope for Christ's resurrection. And so in order for them to teach the Torah, they would ultimately say that not only was the written law sufficient, but that there needed to be something called the oral law which was the interpretation of the written law, which could then be taught and propagated to the people of Israel. And so the, pro the Pharisees and the Sadducees were known as something called the Hasidim. Hasidim in Hebrew, translated to English, is the pious ones. They separated themselves from society on the basis of particular religious laws and teachings. Can I give you some examples? They believed that they were separate from fellow Jews and Gentiles because of the purity and cleanliness laws that they lifted up. But the dividing line for those who were Pharisaical and Sadducee in nature was that the Sabbath had to be kept at all costs. From Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, no work, no play, ultimate stillness and devotion to God's presence. And so the majority population that the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law looked down upon and condemned can you guess where they came from? Galilee. Do you know someone else who comes from Galilee? Jesus Christ himself. Jesus comes from Nazareth in Galilee, which is the area that the Pharisees and the Sadducees looked down upon the most. So you can imagine throughout Jesus' uh, ministry, when he encounters some friends who bring a man in need of forgiveness and restoration, and Jesus says, your sins have been forgiven. The Pharisees and the Sadducees say, no, 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 no. Only God is allowed to forgive sin. That's blasphemy. When Jesus is walking regularly and calls Matthew, who is a tax collector, to be his disciple, he goes back to Matthew's home and feasts and eats with other tax collectors. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the chief priests were the first to object and say, no, 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 he's eating with the wrong people. Then Jesus heals a, a woman with a withered hand, but he heals her on the Sabbath. And they immediately object and say, no, 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 he may have healed her, but he healed her on the wrong day. So you can understand why Christ has a deep dislike for the chief priests and the teachers of the law. Jesus comes from the wrong place. He eats with the wrong people and he works on the wrong day. Now, the religious establishment has to find a way to give Rome a valid reason to execute and crucify Christ. Go read the, go read the ministries or, or the gospel consistently and you would begin to understand that the accusation that Christ levels at these chief priests and teachers of the law is the following. He calls them hypocrites. Now, if your English vocabulary is deficient, can I remind you of what a hypocrite is? A hypocrite is one who professes to be one thing, but in the depth of their heart, they really are something else, which is why Jesus turns the mirror on the religious leaders to get them to take a deep dive into their own character and own convictions to see whether their accusations really come from a pure and a holy place. Friends, I want to lift up three points to you that I think is important for us. Because just as Jesus is a threat to religious elitism, 
I think Jesus is also a threat to current contemporary Christianity. Three words, three points I wanna lift up in your presence and then I'll be out your way. The first one I wanna lift up is that Jesus calls into question when we use our position to condemn and not to comfort. Jesus calls into question when we use our position to condemn and not to comfort. Now, I want to lift up one word that Jesus speaks to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the religious establishment. He says, a day is coming when the Son of Man will be seated. First look and first glance and reading, that word might not mean much to us, but that word seated is loaded with meaning and prominence. Remember that when Jesus is on trial, they are gathered in the courtyard with the high priest Caiaphas, 71 high priests or chief priests in total, and they would all have been seated while Jesus had to stand as the defendant and give an account for the accusations that they were throwing in his direction. So why is this important? Because Jesus is saying, a day is coming when I will not be standing as a defendant, but I will be seated in authority and in power, and you will be standing to give an account for your misuse and abuse of your religion. Friends, these Pharisees, Sadducees, and teachers of the Lord, you know what they were accustomed to? They were accustomed to pointing out people's, uh, um, people's faults and failures, but they weren't willing to give them forgiveness. They were willing to point out how broken people were, but they weren't willing to stretch out an arm to build them up. They were willing to tear people down in the name of their religion and the name of their holiness. But in that process, they excluded people from the grace and the goodness of God. Friends, why is that important? Because contemporary Christianity will sometimes make you think because of your position that you have a more close relationship with God than other people, which allows you to look down on other people in condemnation rather than extending comfort and compassion of Christ. Friends, so many people have fallen into the trap, just as these teachers of law have done, into thinking that their position, either in church, their position in life, their position in society gives them the right to condemn those who don't look like them, think like them, or practice their faith like them instead of extending comfort. This is what Jesus says to them. You are so used to standing over other people that a day is coming when I will be seated in authority and power and you will have to give an account for what you've done when you were seated in your power and authority over other people. But maybe there's a flip side to this, that there's a comforting aspect to it as well. That for those of us who have been hurt by people who have assumed religious positions, by those of us who have been discarded and disregarded by the people that we thought should have displayed and represented God to us, can I give you a comforting word? That when you are on the receiving end of condemnation, um, can I just see by a show of hands, who likes speed? When you drive, you like to drive like a madman. Thank God most of you, I'm not alone. I, I, I love speed. Recently, approximately three weeks, uh, I went on leave and I went home to Cape Town for two weeks. And my friend, he owns a Mercedes sports car. And I've always begged him and asked him if I could drive his car just once. Now remember, he gave in and he caved in and he said, Damon, it's okay, you can drive my Mercedes, but just be careful on the road. I remember driving on the N2 from my hometown into Cape Town itself. And I was in the right lane but I wanted to veer off and turn into the left lane. And as I was about to turn, his rear view mirror gave that almost orange light that kept beeping to remind me that there was something in my blind spot that I was unable to see and that if I was about to merge into the left, I would hit something in my blind spot. But being the person that I am and liking speed, I thought I'm not gonna slow down for this car. Let me try cut and snip in front of him so that I don't have to slow down. And then as I looked in my side mirror, that mirror preached to me and reminded me of God's presence, even when other people cause for there to be a blind spot in your faith. I looked at that mirror and like most of our mirrors, the mirror at the bottom says, objects in this mirror are closer than they appear. The object that I had lost sight of was far closer than I had thought. And so my friend almost stepped on the brakes in his passenger seat to remind me 
that the car that I was trying to get in front of is far closer than it makes out to be. Friends, can I remind you that the God that we serve, the God who may be fractured or may be made invisible through the conduct of other people to you is far closer than you think. Just like that mirror said, objects in this mirror appears or is closer than they appear. The God that we serve and the God who carries us is far closer than we can ever imagine. Even when other people disappoint you, disregard you, and ultimately discredit you, this is the God who is closer than you can ever think or imagine. So friends, firstly, Jesus challenges the position that we have when we use it to condemn rather than to comfort. Can I lay the second point on your lap? The second one is the following. Jesus says that the privilege of the religious leaders have been used to create a hierarchy of sin. Can I repeat that? The privilege of the religious leaders has been used to create a hierarchy of sin. Remember, these are the protectors of the law. These are the arbiters of the law. These are the people who gatekeep the law. And what they've done in their misuse and misuse of their religion is that they've decided that there are specific sins in the law that get grade A, other sins get grade B, and other sins ultimately get grade C. They've said, your sins over there are more extreme than our sins. Your sins over there are more callous and more frustrating than our sins. In other words, they've used their system to give themselves a sense of self-righteousness in looking down on other people. Maybe this is why Jesus uses the phrase when he responds to them, and he says, the day is coming when I will be seated at the right side of the God, of the almighty God. Now, what's important is that in Jewish tradition and custom, when someone said that they were sitting on the right side of God Almighty, it was a reminder to his hearers that he was going to sit in the place of privilege, the place of position, and the place of power as he goes into the full presence of God. They think that he's a maniac who claims to be God. But he says, a day is coming when you will see that I'm actually the one who assumes true privilege and true position. Now, why is that important? Because the religious leaders and the teachers of the law thought because of their position and their privilege that they could make other sins more egregious than their own and think that because their sins were small that they were still fine with God. And here's the danger with self-righteousness. Self-righteousness will make you think you don't need God. Self-righteousness will make you think that you are better than other people when in actual fact all of us are in need of the grace and the goodness of God. This is what the religious leaders were guilty of. They used the scriptures not as a mirror but rather as a microscope. Ooh, can I repeat that? They used the scriptures as a microscope to zoom in on the, on the sins of other people rather than allowing the scriptures to be a mirror that causes them to reflect on their own faults and their own failures. And friends, contemporary religion and, and Christianity is filled with people who downplay and downsize their own sins and compare themselves to other people and say, at least I'm not like such and such. Can I remind you in Luke chapter 18, just a couple of chapters before this, Jesus shares that parable where he says two men go into the temple. One is a tax collector and one is a Pharisee. The tax collector does not even look up to heaven and says, Lord, I'm guilty of sin. Please forgive me and be merciful on me. And then the Pharisee looks up straight to heaven and says, Lord, at least I'm not like that tax collector over there. Jesus in saying that I am seated and will one day be seated at the right hand of God, says that he himself and him alone will be able to judge who is in perfect step with him and who is not. Now, can I just see by show of hands, who likes shopping? Uh, when I originally moved here from Cape Town, uh, I, I heard about this prominent and popular place called Santon City. I heard about Santon Mall. And so I thought, well, being the Cape Townian that I am, let me go explore. Never been in Santon. I've heard it's the most popular, the most prestigious area in South Africa. I stepped into Santon Mall and I decided to go into a shop called Europa Co. and Art. Just by seeing that title and seeing by the name of the shop, I should have known I had no right being there. Walked into the shop and I needed sneakers and there was a plain pair of sneakers that caught my attention and my eye. 
I uh, called over the shop assistant. I said, I'm interested in buying these sneakers. And I saw that there was no price tag on the sneaker. I thought, that's strange. The shop assistant said to me, go to the checkout area, and the lady working on duty will assist you to buy the sneakers. Went up to the reception area, bought the sneakers with me, uh, and she said, uh, I, I see there's no price tag here. I'm going to ask the shop assistant to get the price tag. Shop assistant comes back. The woman working at the reception says to me, sir, that'll be 6,990 rand. I said, the devil is a liar. She said to me, sir, unfortunately, you missed the price tag. And so therefore, you missed the value and the worth of these sneakers. These are called Lagerfeld sneakers. They are some of the most popular and some of the most prestigious sneakers that we have in our shop. But because you missed the price tag, you missed the value and the worth that these sneakers carry. Friends, can I tell you when Jesus says that he's going to be seated at the right hand of God Almighty, it's a reminder to him and the religious leaders that he has to go through the crucifixion. And the crucifixion is where there is no gradation of sin, but where everyone stands equal in the sight of God. Can I tell you about what the cross of Christ does? The cross of Christ says to those who get haughty and arrogant that ultimately you will be brought low because that's what the cross does. For those of us who get too low on ourselves and think that we are worth nothing, the cross lifts us up and reminds us that the ground is equal at the cross of Christ. Seating and being seated at the right hand of God Almighty is for Christ a proclamation that a day is coming when he assumes ultimate authority where all people will be equal in his sight, where there will be no arbiters of the law to keep eye on whose sins are greater and lesser. So friends, my question is, are we using our privilege to create a hierarchy of sin or are we reflecting the God who says that all are equal in his sight? Then the last one that I want to lay in your lap, and then I'll be out your way, is that Jesus says, you say that I am. Remember, they ask him the question, are you the king of the Jews? Are you the Messiah? Are you the one that we've been waiting for? And his response is, you say that I am. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm in conversation with someone and I share something that I already know, and someone says to me, you said it. That's a way of deflecting and reflecting to that person that deep down there's something in your heart that you've concealed and hidden that you know to be truth, but you've tried to suppress that truth. So when Jesus says, you say I am, it's Jesus' way of saying, you know that I am who I say I am. And so the third and the final point that Christ lifts up is the following, that the teachers of the law and the chief priests had an interpretation of God that was not rooted in the incarnation of Christ. In other words, they interpreted an image and a picture of God that was not rooted in the image of God that we find in Jesus Christ. In other words, these religious leaders had read and studied all the scriptures, but they missed the image and the true nature and character of God. They worked with religious scriptures all day, they defended them, they propagated them, they taught them, they interpreted them, but they missed the image of God that was being pointed to. Friends, whenever you encourage or whenever you encounter a snippet in Scripture that seems unlike Christ, call it into question. Whenever you encounter something that does not match up and meet with who God is in Christ, call it into question. Uh, I want to end with this illustration. Uh, I'm a massive football fan. Football is by far my favorite sport, or soccer as it's known in South Africa. The unfortunate thing is that I'm a massive Aston Villa fan. You see, some of you don't even know who that team is. Being an Aston Villa fan is not easy. They have been dark, dreary, and absolutely ominous days being an Aston Villa fan. A couple of years ago, when I was still at seminary, uh, I went to a party with my friends, and I had a Man United shirt on me. Someone had the audacity to take a photo of me wearing a Man United shirt and they posted it in a WhatsApp group with all of my friends. Message after message came through the group. They said, why is Damien wearing a Man United shirt when he supports Aston Villa? What has gone wrong with him? My question that I asked them was, surely you know who I am, so surely you should have asked more about why I'm wearing the shirt. They missed the context. And they forgot that I wore the Man United shirt, not just to any party, I wore it to a Halloween party. Because I try to make a statement. I'm petty and I have an attitude. 
to make the statement that the Man United shirt is the scariest thing that I could find to wear to the Halloween party. If they knew me the way that they really should have known me, they would have known that I'm really in favor of Aston Villa, but I'm only wearing the Man United shirt because I'm being petty and I have an attitude. Friends, whenever it comes to knowing God and seeing the full image and picture of God, whenever you encounter condemnation in Scripture, call it into question. Whenever you see self-righteousness in Scripture, call it into question. Whenever you see violence and vengeance in Scripture, call it into question because it has to align with the very image of who Christ is. It has to be according to you say that I am. I am who I say I am. I am the one that you've been awaiting. And the reason why you've missed me is because your interpretation is not in alignment with the incarnation. So friends, as I close and I conclude, the question is, are you using scripture and your position to condemn or to comfort? Secondly, are you living with a hierarchy of sin thinking that you're more righteous than other people because at least you're not like them? And lastly, does the image that you have of God match up with Christ so that you don't miss God's presence in your midst. Friends, shall we pray? Let us bid. Arira piling. Reale bo antati mudimu. Reale bo moya u halilelang. Reale bo Jesu Christe. Antati mudimu kika muhawa mudimu ripila kamuhaw. Lord, this evening we remember that it is by your grace that we live and move and have our being. Lord, this evening we remember that you are the God who is with us, that you are the God who will never leave us nor forsake us. And so, Father, we ask that we would take these challenges to heart. These same challenges that you confronted the religious elite with, the same challenges that are still applicable to our own Christianity today. Lord, may we do some soul searching. May we look deep within our own hearts to ask ourselves the question. Have we used our position to condemn rather than comfort? Lord, have we used our privilege to create a hierarchy of sin? And finally, Lord, have we used our prestige to miss the incarnation of who you are? Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we honor you because we remember that you are God. Mudimu ki mudimu. Mudimu Yarifudisang. You are the God of our healing. And so we pray this evening, Lord, that you will convict us, challenge us, and change us to be everything that you have called and commissioned us to be. Here ons vraag ons bid vir al die dinge in in die krachtige, prachtige en heilige naam. In the name of our Lord and our Savior, we do pray. Kalibit sola Jesu Christe. Amen. Friends, we remember that any sermon is not just meant to be listened to, but it's also meant to be responded to. And so you should have a, a brief little pamphlet and a little booklet. I'm just going to invite you in your own time, uh, whenever you're ready. You'll see on Holy Tuesday, there's a question there, what have I heard Jesus say to me? And then secondly, what do I want to say in response to Jesus? I invite you just for a couple of minutes to write uh, your answers in there, and then you're welcome to maybe just offer up a prayer in your own heart over what you've heard Jesus saying to you and what you would offer up in response to Christ.
Thank you, friends. Uh, I'm going to invite Maruti Linda to come to the front as she leads us in our, our closing. Thank you. And so, God, thank you for your word. For it is in your word that you transform us as you move us from our places of comfort to our places of uncomfort. And so as we challenge and invite us to look ourselves into the mirror, may we really see who we are in this journey of faith. Thank you for the message that you've laid upon your servant. Amen. And so we... I invite you to stand as we bless one another with our Holy Week blessing. And so we pray as we journey with Jesus through his suffering to his death. His words of grace and truth. May his words transform our hearts and inspire our minds that we may live lives that testify to God's love. Amen.